you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Revelation chapter 19. As we've been coming through every Sunday sharing in the tribulation period, here comes one of those refreshing moments. Uh, if you've ever heard the song, uh, the Hallelujah Chorus, uh, Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, it was written out of Revelation chapter 19. Uh, we get to the point now where there's going to be a wedding feast. And I want you to understand again that Jesus Christ died for the church. You and I are the bride of Christ. Christ is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And there's going to be a wedding feast. After the tribulation period, we studied last week and we saw last week where uh, the Babylon system comes crashing down. The religious, false religious system, political system, the economic system all comes crashing down uh, in a worldwide event. Then we, John gets to see in heaven, he gets to see uh, this uh, wedding feast uh, uh, that is being prepared. Uh, it is refreshing and, and exciting, it's a refreshing and exciting portion of the scripture. After all the dismal things that we have been sharing uh, that has dealt with exclusively with the judgment and fall of, of Babylon, uh, again, these, these six verses is known as the Hallelujah Chorus. Y'all know that song, right? Uh, if, if you don't, go look it up and listen to it. It's a great song. Uh, when I was in high school in the choir, we sung that song. Uh, it's a, like a 12-fold song, and uh, it's movement all over the place, and I'm too old to sing that now. But uh, anyway, go and listen to it. There's some great choirs that do a great job with that. Can I share with you that this is no ordinary wedding? The wedding that we're about to share in is no ordinary wedding, and uh, it, it is true. It is coming. It is an event that's going to happen. It is not a metaphor. It is not something that uh, is some kind of playwright. Uh, John wasn't crazy when he saw this and, and wrote about this. This is the Word of God. It, actually, it, 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 it has been told throughout the ages. The church is going to be raptured up and we're going to spend time with Jesus. We're going to see that in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, we're going to read 19, uh, verses 1 through 10 out of Revelation 19. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and rise to your feet. Revelation 19, 1 through 10. We began in verse 1 and it said, After the fall of Babylon, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Welcome to the choir, the heavenly choir, right? Saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they say, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God, omnipotent, reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, talking about falling at the feet of the angel. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. May God add his blessing to the reader's word. Will you bow with me as we're about to attend a wedding? 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to gather together here. And God, as we have seen the rapture of the church, we've seen the, the tribulation period. God, we come now to a, a wedding, dear Heavenly Father, where the bride is going to meet the bridegroom. Or can I say it the other way? The bride, uh, the, 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 yeah, the bride is going to meet the bridegroom. The church is going to meet Jesus Christ. Now, I know, dear Heavenly Father, the rapture had taken place. But God, this is a culmination of, uh, of, of, of the love of Jesus Christ for the church that has, been, it has now been prepared, this prepared place for prepared people, that the bride is going to be presented to the bridegroom. What a glorious time that we get to see what John saw in this event. Again, Lord, it is an event that is coming. It is as true as the Word of God. Just be with us as we share this today, dear Heavenly Father. May it, may it give us joy and peace. Those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It is the Hallelujah Chorus. Now, I understand you're sitting there and you're saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, there is the word Hallelujah there instead of Hallelujah. Well, I will share with you that hallelujah with an H comes from the Hebrew word, from the spelling, which means exactly the same thing that hallelujah does. Hallelujah comes from the Latin spelling. By the way, hallelujah is the greatest praise that we can give unto God. It is, it is a high praise that is giving unto God. And so we see here that there is a choir, there is a multitude as, uh, uh, as they prepare to sing, uh, uh, as they prepare to share in the wedding feast that is there. It is here that we get our, in this hallelujah chorus, it is here that we get our first glimpse at the excitement and the rejoicing that will surround the marriage of the Lamb. You know, for many, a wedding day is filled with nervousness. I can remember the September the 8th, 1984. I, used to, I told my kids all the time, Tracy's grandfather was a pastor. He married us. And so I would tell my children all the time when they were growing up that since it was her grandfather, she married me. He done, it was her side. She married me. Now, I, I, but, but we know that we both married each other. September the 8th, I'm telling Tracy's age, 1984 is when we got married. Do the math. You'll know how old she is. She was like 35 when we got married. And so just kind of figure that out. I remember that day being pretty stressful. How about y'all? Y'all remember all the preparations and all the nervousness and all the things that, you know, that, that goes into planning that and, and going through all of that. And, and for many people, it is a nervous day. For many people, it is a stressful moment. Uh, but, but it is a celebration in itself. And it is reserved for those uh, who attend the ceremony. Not everybody gets to share in your wedding. There was people who didn't come to mine. I'm sure there was those who didn't come to yours. But it is a ceremony nonetheless. Now I want you to notice this. This word, alleluia, again, praise our God, alleluia, is repeated. You see that it was repeated again and again in the, in the verses that we've read here. And matter of fact, I think that kind of sets the atmosphere of the wedding feast, uh, of the wedding event that's about to take place. It, it, listen, it is a, it, it's an abbreviation. Alleluia is an abbreviation. It's a Latin form of, of the Hebrew word, hallelujah. Which comes from two words, Hallel, which uh, means praise, and uh, and Yahweh, that's the end of the uh, of that word. There, you are uh, is the Lord. So it's really praise uh, the Lord. Uh, uh, and so here's the thing about that word. That word, uh, Hallelujah, literally is in every language that we know of. That word has the same meaning. It is coming to every language. It is coming to all nationalities. And it literally expresses a praise in every language that has that word. As a matter of fact, even those that don't even know God, sometimes they'll say, well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a great word that is. 
And so we find here this <coughs> hallelujah chorus that we call it. We've named these verses the hallelujah chorus because of that. Now, what was it that they saw? I want you to notice the first thing that we see in this hallelujah chorus is a praise for salvation. Go back with me in verse 1. And it's headed after these things, after the burning down of Babylon, after this world system comes crashing down, the angel comes out into heaven and, 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 and the wedding is getting prepared. It's in verse 1 he says, and after these things uh, I heard a great choir, a great voice uh, of much people in heaven and they were singing uh, a hallelujah chorus a uh, hallelujah. Notice what it says after that. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. I want to start right there because the first uh, uh, stanza of the song, the first words that is uttered by the choir is the word salvation. Why would you think that? Well, I think it is fitting that all the redeemed begins to praise the Lord for his marvelous salvation. When this world comes crashing down, when the world system has let everybody down, when this Babylon system that is, uh, ha, ha, has been the, 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 the sorcery and the trickery of mankind and man has put his faith and trust in, in, in the world's religious system, in the world's political system, system, in the world's economic system, and as we've seen all of this comes crashing down, salvation could be no sweeter than in this moment. And so they sit there and they literally utter this word, uh, salvation. It is here, I believe, that the reality of, of what we have received really begins to set in into heaven. Salvation really takes on a, a, a new meaning when the world is being or has been destroyed. I, I don't know about you, but I often think about Noah and his family, what they must have felt like when, when they have their salvation through God in an ark and the rest of the world is wiped out. I, I can just imagine the, the gratitude that they must have had for God. I can just imagine the worship that took place on an ark out of eight little souls that was left on this, on this earth. They understood what salvation by God was truly all about. I think the same thing here, this praise of salvation. Uh, I think uh, uh, we will become uh, uh, keenly aware of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has made so that we might be, uh, or that we have been saved. We will see and behold, listen, uh, standing in heaven, here's the thing, we're going to see all the splendor that Jesus Christ left to come down to an earth and, and hang on an old rugged cross to die for you and me. We're literally standing there in the splendor of heaven. Again, those that have put our faith and trust in Jesus. Now, when you understand the church isn't just because uh, the, the church is not just those that got their names on a church row. They're not ones who attend church. Uh, the church is those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he done on the cross. And the people that are saved is the bride. It is the church. And so we find here this, this, uh, this splendor of heaven and, and, and the realization, the reality of, of salvation. And, and, and I don't know, surely, uh, surely we will be mindful at that point of uh, uh, the suffering of the cross. Uh, surely we understand, uh, as we do today, the empty tomb. And, and surely we understand his resurrection because Jesus Christ will be there. He will be the groom. And so it is a praise of salvation they're singing. Hallelujah for salvation. The next thing I want you to notice is this. This is a praise for victory. For we find in verse 2 and 3, it picks up and it says, For true and righteous are his judgment. He has judged the great Lord. He has judged the system. He has judged Babylon. He has judged the heart of man. He has judged the false religions. He has judged the, the, the sins of the world. And so he comes on here and, and says that he is an overcomer of those things. It goes on says, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged, look at this verse, verse 2, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. 
He, he is, he's become the victor. I told you, folks, we're not victims. We are victors. We're not victims of this world. We're victors in Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 3 says, and again they said, Alleluia, and our smoke rose up forever and ever. The choir, after singing about the salvation, the choir offers praise for the purity and the righteousness of God. He is just. God is just. I, I, again, it doesn't matter what happens in this world and what happens in your life. I want you to always remember that our God is a just God. And so uh, in, in this justice, uh, in, in his judgment, he has done what is right. In the collapse of the system. And uh, dealing with the false world religions. He has done in judgment what is just. And listen, there won't be any souls gathered there in heaven. Uh, listen, uh, that matter of fact, uh, every person in heaven has, has uh, suffered the affliction of sin, right? But again, there's only two types of people in the world. There are sinners and sinners saved by grace. Uh, and, and so those that have been saved by grace are the ones that are singing uh, how God is victorious over all. Matter of fact, uh, there won't be a, 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 listen, God it was just in his judgment and, and, and we've finally been fully separated. Here's, here's the thing, here's the victory. As the choir is singing, listen, sin cannot get to them anymore. There is no such thing as sin in heaven. And so they stand in this place of glory about to share in the wedding feast, about to be joined with, with, with the groom. And, and, and as they stand there, sin cannot mar, sin cannot mess up the wedding. The fullness of salvation, the fullness of victory. All of us have battled sin in our life, but we're going to a place a place where sin and Satan won't be welcome and sin and Satan won't be present. Why? Because we can sing a song of victory. They sing the song of victory. We no longer, listen, not only will we not have to deal with sin, but we won't even have to deal with the effects of sin. There'll be no more ruined lives. Listen, there'll be no more battered children. There'll be no more broken homes. There'll be no, nothing that this world offers in this place called heaven. There'll be no more temptations. Uh, listen, everybody will know what is right. Everybody will do what is right. Praise God, the victory has been won. And we sing of our, rede our Redeemer, the one who had conquered all of this for us. What a wedding is being planned. What a day it's going to be. So there's a praise of salvation. There's a praise of victory. Well, if you got salvation and you got victory, you know it's going to lead to a praise of worship. You know there's going to be worship that's going to take place. It's going to lead us to that point in verse 4 and 5. And it said in the 4 and 20 elders. Y'all remember the 4 and 20 elders. We've already studied that, right? The 4 and 20 elders and the 4 beasts that was around the throne, they fell down and they began to worship God at the wedding feast. They began, uh, listen, when they hear the choir sing the song of salvation, when they hear the choir sing uh, the song of victory, praise, uh, worship begins to break out. And listen, the four beasts fall down and they worship God that sat on the throne saying, amen, here it is again, alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, praise, this is what alleluia means, praise to this our God. And all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Once again, we find these 24 elders around the throne doing as they always have done, the 24 elders, falling on their face before God and worshiping him. You remember what I told you about the 24 elders? They are a picture of all the redeemed. They're the pictures of all the redeemed. We go back, there were 12, uh, listen, in the Old Testament time, right? 12 tribes. In the New Testament time, there was 
uh, there was a, a, a 12 apostles. Uh, so we have the Old Testament, New Testament come together in the 24 elders. The, listen, all those uh, uh, that were redeemed, uh, the redeemed people, they uh, uh, the representation of that, a picture of all the saints of God, the hallelujah chorus uh, will involve pure, unhindered worship. It'll be worship like we've never had before. It'll be worship like we've never seen before. I don't know about you, but I probably, I just, I've never had worship, I don't believe, like I'll be able to have worship there where sin no longer has a hope, where, listen, where, where, where pride no longer is in the way. That it is nothing more than humility humble. So many times in our life, we've allowed pride to keep us to get in the way of worshiping the way that we ought to. So many times we've held back and, and so many times we haven't gave, uh, given the genuine heartfelt worship that God desired. But in heaven, we will offer a praise that the Lord deserves. We will offer a praise like never before. Uh, listen, again, when there is no hindrance whatsoever, it is nothing but uh, the praise at the wedding feast. What a wonderful, wonderful time. And we will have. Matter of fact, I just believe this. If we ever fully got a hold of what Christ has done for us here on this earth, I believe it would really change how we pray and how we worship Him now. But with that being said, one day we're going to have a praise and worship like we've never had before. Wouldn't it be good to get into heaven here now to do that? Wouldn't it be good to... To, to worship God like that. And listen, don't hold back and have genuine, heartfelt worship to, to offer that praise that the Lord deserves. But here's the thing, man. We get there. Listen, we ain't even got flesh. We got a glorified body. I can't imagine how a glorified body is going to worship. I know this. It's going to worship in a way that's going to please Him and bring praise to God. There's a wedding feast being planned. There's a, there's a praise of salvation. There's a, a praise of victory. There's a praise of worship. And then there's praise for sovereignty. For the sovereignty of God. Notice what the Bible tells us in verse 6. It goes on and it says, And I heard as it was the voice of a great multitude as the voice of many what? Now there was a multitude singing. Now here's another multitude. I, I heard a uh, a voice of a great multitude and the voice of many waters as the voice of mighty thundering saying, here it is again, Alleluia, for the Lord God, look at this, omnipotent reigneth, omnipotent, all-powerful. Our, our God is the all-powerful one. He is the sovereign one. This Hallelujah chorus concludes with a praise for the reign of the omnipotent Lord. He is the almighty one. Again, he is the all-powerful Lord. There is none besides him. He alone stands uh, uh, as the God of the universe. And here we are. Now listen, we, we, we stand and we serve one who stands as the ruler of all things, great and small. For he is sovereign God. He is sovereign over everything. Matter of fact, he carries us back to Isaiah 45 and 6. In Isaiah 45 and 6, and 6, it says this, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Again, that's Isaiah 45, 6. The prophet Isaiah also wrote this in Isaiah 43 and 13. It says, yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? We will offer praise and honor to the God of heaven. The true, this is why I say every Sunday that we worship a true and living God. Amen. The true and living God. The Savior of of our souls. He said, the angel says, the multitude says, the, the, the wedding is, bless, hallelujah, praise our God. There is the praise of sovereign. Now let's look real quick as we get ready to close at the heavenly ceremony. 
Let's look at the heavenly ceremony. As the chorus, as the choir concludes, the wedding ceremony begins. The marriage of the Lamb is now come. The, the day generations of saints have longed for and has longed to see the day that we wed our groom. The day that we wed our king. Notice verse 7, the first part there. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. The bridegroom is praised. Think about that. On the earth, it doesn't happen that way. On the earth, it's about the bride. On the earth, everybody stands with anticipation as, as the groom stands at the front. Everybody stands in anticipation because it's the bride. It's the, it's the bride's day. The bride has planned. It is her day. Everyone stands as the bride comes in. Everyone looks at the bride. The bride has spent time to look the best that she can look on this faithful day. But not here. Notice, the bridegroom. Let us give honor to him. We've all attended weddings and we waited with anticipation for the wedding march. We, we wait on that song and, and as soon as that song starts, the wedding march, everybody turns and they look back at the, at the door waiting for the entrance of the bride. The time when the bride would make her entrance. Matter of fact, the bride making her interest is the highlight of the wedding in our culture. But this wedding will be unlike any that we've ever known. As the bridegroom stands to take his bride, he will be the focus of attention. He will be the one whom the hallelujahs were reserved for. Think about that. Can you imagine the joy of that time? Consider all the times that you've been faced with adversity. All the times that you were in the midst of the storm in your life. All the time that you were weary from the journey. And yet the Lord came to comfort you in your time. Listen, He is the bridegroom. He's the groom to take care of the bride. I don't know about you, but I felt His presence. He's been present in my life. He's been near to me in many of the situations in my life. And I can't begin to tell you all that the Lord has done for me in my Christian life. But, but listen, even with that, I've never physically been able to behold his presence. And here at the, at the wedding feast, we see the bridegroom and the hallelujahs that have been saved for him will be rained out for the groom on that day. There's a wedding coming. I realize that, yeah, we'll see him when we're raptured up, when the church is raptured. But this will be a day. This wedding feast day will be a day of unrivaled beauty. It will be a day of overwhelming joy as, as we behold the lamb that was slain for our transgression. To, listen, when he steps out to take us unto himself as his bride the bride the bride the church will offer unending praise for the bridegroom we will stand astounded at his love because truly we were an unworthy bride and yet the bible says at this wedding feast the bride will be presented. Look at verse 7 again and 8. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife. Here we are church. For the marriage of the Lamb is now. For the marriage ceremony is about to take place. All oh, for the ages of time. Uh, it has been waited on. Uh, listen, it has been prepared. And now the time has come. And his wife, the church. Hey, listen, has made herself ready. And to her was granted, listen, given to her, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteous, here it is, is the righteousness of saints. Here's the righteousness of saints. At the weddings I've attended, people always talk about how beautiful 
the bride was. Why? Because she has put forth much effort for that day to look great for her groom and for that wedding feast. And yet look at this. As the church is presented as the bride of Christ. To, listen, she has never been more beautiful. The church has never been more beautiful than, than, than the church will be at this time. Listen, the church, she hasn't been perfect. She hasn't been perfect. There were times when she failed to meet the groom's expectation. But here's the thing that I know from the very foundation of the world. Listen, the bride has been loved unconditionally by the groom. Even in times when the church wasn't what the groom wanted her to be. She has been loved by him. And the church, the bride, is beautiful in his eyes. You know how I know that? Because he loved her enough to die for her. She is literally the object of his affection. She is presented in fine linen. She's presented clean and white. The purity of the bride before the Lord. Living in a body of flesh, we all fail and come short of the glory of, of God. But here, listen, we stand in righteousness because of the blood of the, uh, uh, of, of the groom that was, that was shed, that has been applied. On this day, we stand there without sin. On this day, pure and white. Think about that. We will be as God intended for us to be. The bride will be holy. The bride will be pure. The bride will be free of sin. Ephesians 5, 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Here it is. Ephesians 5, 27. Backs it up. Ephesians 5, 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. Again, Ephesians 5, 27. There are some guests that are going to be present. Guests that are presented here. I love this here. Who, who are the other guests that are there? We go on in verse 9. And he said unto me, Right blessed are they which are called. There are those that are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. There are those who want to see this event. Now listen, this, this is not the bride. This is someone. This is invited guest. As the wedding ceremony commences, it will be surrounded by a host of guests looking on. Who are they? Well, I, can, can I give you in my mind who I think they are? I think it's Old Testament saints. I think it's those that have been martyred in the, as in, in the tribulation period. Not the church that has been raptured up, but those in the Old Testament. Hey, you know who's going to be there? Some, uh, I, I believe, I know some of the invited guests. It'll be like a man named Enoch. Uh, it, it'll be a man named Noah, or how about Abraham, or Moses, or Joshua, or David, or Isaiah, or Jeremiah, or Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or John. And we can just go on. And on and on. In the Old Testament time, those who saw a type of, of Jesus Christ and a picture of Him before Christ came. Again, those who have died as martyrs at, through the tribulation period. Those who have served the Lord rather than served the pleasures of man. Ready to close. Third point, the honest confirmation. As John witnessed the marriage of the Lamb concluding, he was given a confirmation to write it down. To write down. Notice this, the certainty of the promise. There's a certainty that was given unto John. John what John is seeing in his vision is not just a vision that's not going to happen. It is the certainty of this. Watch this, verse 9. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. All that John has witnessed is surely going to come to pass. Everything that John has seen, these are truly the sayings of God. It has been a glorious scene for John and it will take place just as God has revealed it. The church one day will stand before the bridegroom as his blood bought bride. The Bible tells us that. It is His Word. 
We have encountered, no, no doubt, much prophecy in Revelation. And each of, these, each of those prophecies is going to come past. They're going to come true. The word of God will stand. Listen, the word of God is going to stand when Babylon is still sitting there burning and smoke rising up from this world. When this world is destroyed, God's word will continue on. The world may scoff. They may doubt. We may be ridiculed or we may be belittled for our faith. But one day, all that God has promised will come to pass. Many times the Bible uses the phrases, and it came to pass. You can read, as you read the Bible, saying, and it came to pass. All the things about Jesus Christ, all the prophecies about Jesus Christ has come to pass, except for his return, except for the final uh, culmination of God's plan for this world. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ is the center of all prophecy. Let's look at the center of all prophecy, verse 10. As again, as we get ready to bring it down, and I fell at his feet to worship him, worship the angel that was uh, that was showing this, sharing all of this, and him seeing this. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, I'm just like you. I'm of and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Hey, you worship God. For the testimony of Jesus, look at this, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of the prophecy. Once again, John is so moved. By what he has seen. That he falls at the feet of an angel. About to offer worship. And once again. The angel. that has, Same thing has happened in numerous times. The angel stops John. And says that he's just a servant as well. It is here that. That the angel reminds John. That all he has seen. Every single event. Every single prophecy. Is centered. Around. Jesus Christ. The, the, the revelation that, that, that he has seen. The revelation that he has seen from chapter 1 to chapter 19. Is the unveiling of Christ himself. I told you revelation is not plural. It is the revelation. It is the, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Do you know the Bible is a hymn book? Not a H-Y-M-N book, but a H-I-M book. It's a hymn book. He is found, God, Jesus Christ, is found in every book of the Bible. He is presented in all generations in the Bible from, from the beginning to the end. Much prophecy of the Old Testament points to Christ's first advent, his first coming. Much of the Old Testament uh, shows uh, his sacrificial death. Each of those have been fulfilled. The prophecy that John has received as well as others concerning his second coming will be just as fulfilled as those of the Old Testament, of those of the New Testament. It will be fulfilled just like God said. Listen, it's going to come to pass. Why? Because Jesus is the focal point of prophecy and of our faith. He is, listen, the center of heaven. Mm -hmm. There stands a groom. There is a waiting plan. The question I ask you, can you sit here today and say, I look forward to that day as I stand up as part of the bride of Christ? Can you say that today? Can you say that I, I plan on being included in the wedding in the sky? What about you? Can uh, are you an invited guest? Are you the church? Or are you the bridegroom? Have, have you made preparation? You know, I've always said heaven's a prepared place for prepared people. Have you made preparation to be a part of the bride? Those who are saved that will be presented as the bride to the bridegroom? Or are you one of those that have rejected him? And will not even to be, a, be able to be a guest at the wedding. If you plan to stand as the bride of the Lamb and enjoy the marriage supper, here's what the Bible says. You must be born again. If you don't know Him today, then I can tell you where your life goes. I can tell you if the rapture happens today and you haven't put your faith and trust in Him, if the rapture happens today, you'd be left behind. If you don't put your faith and trust in Him, Tribulation, the wedding feast, you won't attend the wedding feast. Why? 
Because our God is a just God. Because nobody will be at the wedding who didn't deserve to be there. And nobody will be left behind who didn't deserve it. What about you? Are you a bride? Are you ready for the wedding feast? If not, today is the day of your salvation. Heavenly Father.